So today we'll talk about lasers and what they are, how to make them, um, and then all of the different applications. We have spectroscopic applications, but we also have, since they go in a straight line, applications where we can direct energy. So we can direct energy into a small spot. We can use that for laser etching, and you have these laser cutters now that you can buy. Uh, we have uh, military weapons now that can shoot missiles out of the sky, or um, even they're working on shooting artillery shells because it travels at the speed of light. So, you know, an artillery shell is coming in. It's fast, but it's no match for a laser. And so maybe you could heat one of those up and have it explode in the air instead of where your troops are. Or a boat's coming at a at a carrier and it can have a laser weapon to blow a boat out of the water. And, and so we have some examples of that. And then we also have uh, directed energy to create pressure, so photon pressure. You can actually throw uh, lasers at material and, and, exp and measure the amount of pressure put on that object. And you can confine things with lasers. And we actually are getting close to being able to create fusion with lasers. And so that's the National Ignition Facility. Ignition meaning thermonuclear ignition or fusion. So we'll look at all of those things today uh, in this topic on lasers. So we like lasers because, well, for many reasons. One, you can find a very narrow spectral line width. And so you can pick a particular color in the spectrum and have all of those photons be that color. So all those waves are in phase with each other. They all have plus or minus a small amount, but the same wavelength. And that allows us to do spectroscopy with them. Uh, because they go in a straight line, that's directed energy. And so we can, we can do things that you know, light can do. We can photo bleach things. We can cut things. Uh, but for, for this course, we do spectroscopy with them. So let's look at those excited states. We, in a laser, we can pump molecules up to an excited electronic state and then use the, the little cup in the excited state as a reservoir. And so if we can get molecules stuck in this top state for a little bit, then we can stimulate the emission. We can come in with photons that are the correct wavelength and cause the others to jump down. So that was one of our first vocabulary words was stimulated versus uh, spontaneous emission. And so this is stimulated emission. A photon comes in and two come out. So it stimulates a second photon to come out of there. And they are in phase with each other. Uh, taking this complicated energy diagram and simplifying it, we have the Jablonski diagram, which we talked about last time. And that shows all those vibrational levels. Well, for, the, for all of the figures today, we're going to simplify this even more. We're just going to draw these, these energy levels as single lines. And so we're going to have, um, let's see, where's my pen? Well, it seems like I've lost my, my tablet. So we're going to draw these, um, these lines as just single lines. So we'll draw a single line for the bottom of this electronic energy uh, you know, electronic manifold, and then we'll draw a single line for that one and a single line for that one. And we might label these singlet, triplet, singlet, but most of these uh, that we're dealing with in this um, uh, set of notes for the lasers are going to have all the same multiplicity. So they may not be all singlets, they may be doublets, but they're going to all be allowed and we're not going to be dealing with phosphorescence. So we're going to be dealing with fluorescence. We need fast emissions. And so here's what we have for a typical laser. We have an efficient pumping. So we need, we need a substance that will absorb light in the, in the visible region or maybe even the UV region efficiently. So it has a huge absorption peak. And so light efficiently pumps this molecule or this atom to an excited state. And then we often have a, uh, a state where it relaxes through non-radiative relaxation. So we can, oh, this really, I really need the pen. So I don't know what to do about this. Here we go. Yay, OK. So we have efficient pumping of the molecules to an excited electronic state, and then some non-radiative relaxation. And we end up with a lot of molecules right here, or atoms. These could be atoms. And when you look at the population of this, so 
n3 and compare that to n2, if this is n1, look at how n3 is much, much greater than n2. And n3 is at a higher energy. So what we have there is a population inversion. A Boltzmann distribution would not give this. This is not a thermal equilibrium situation. At a given temperature, all the molecules are going to be in a ground state, and a very few will be in the excited state, thermally. What we're doing is we're creating a decidedly non-thermal equilibrium system. We have more molecules in the excited state than in the ground state. And so when one of these molecules or atoms drops down, okay, it emits a photon, right? And that photon matches the energy difference. Does that make sense to everybody? So this energy difference, we have an emission, and that photon that comes out exactly matches that energy difference. And there are a lot of other atoms in that excited state that can interact with that photon. So the first one might be spontaneous, but then all the others are stimulated. So that, sec that first photon that comes out can stimulate the emission of all the others. And so then this one drops down because of the stimulation of that photon, and now we have two that are in phase with each other. And so that's amplified. So that's the amplification that we're talking about. And so this is the general system. This is the general way you make a laser. And so you have this, this picture on the left. You see the thermal equilibrium up at the top? That's never going to produce a laser because you just have one molecule that's excited and the rest are in a ground state. If that molecule that's excited drops down, it'll emit a photon. But what's probably going to happen is another one of those molecules is going to absorb it and it's going to go back up. And so you had one in the upper state, and now you have another one in the upper state. So they just, it's like musical chairs, they just, one gets up and the other one sits back down. So you don't have any amplification of the light. But if you get a population inversion, then when the first one drops down, it can spontaneously, or stimulate, not spontaneously, it'll stimulate the emission of the second one, the waves are in phase, stim stimulates the emission for the others, and eventually you have this large beam that comes out. So that's what's happening energetically. Practically, sort of engineering, if you're going to make one of these, you need a gain medium. That's what this one is. It's the gain medium. And that's what has the, the material in it that's going to produce the laser. And so for uh, really common lasers, we'll see there's the neodymium atom. The neodymium atom has a certain set of energy levels that allows it to laze. And so you'll have a, a, like a garnet crystal, so just like the gemstone garnet, but you'll take the atoms out, you'll actually grow a garnet crystal structure with yttrium and aluminum in a garnet crystal structure, and you'll dope in a certain percentage of neodymium. So you'll have a neodymium doped yttrium aluminum garnet crystal, and you can grow this as a perfect crystal and then cut the rods and then put it in here as the gain medium. If you shine light on that, so this pumping energy, so a flash lamp or some bright light shining on that gain medium, you will get those neodymium atoms up into that population inversion. So you'll excite them with visible light and they'll be ready to go. And then you have this stimu stimulated emission happening and you have a, a, a high reflector, like a 100% mirror in the back, and then a, a partially silvered mirror or a mirror with a tiny hole in it in the front. And so the back is the high reflector, the front is called an output coupler, but it sets up a resonant cavity. So most of the light is bouncing back and forth inside this gain medium and stimulating emission. And so, you know, you don't just get one pass through this. Those photons are turned around and they go back through again and stimulate more emission. And then they go through again. They probably go three, three to five times through this cavity and then they leak out through that hole. Eventually you lose your population inversion and have to pump it back up. Okay. Um, you can have these run in continuous mode where you're constantly supplying visible light, but then you've got the, um, you've got the mirrors and such, and maybe even you put in uh, some sort of uh, grating or, or whatever to, to, to keep just one particular laser line coming out. 
and then you have uh, the laser coming out, but you're pumping visible light in. So you can have uh, a lot of different arrangements. But it, these are the general pieces. You have the gain medium, the pump light, and the resonant cavity with these two mirrors. And then out, coming out of that couplet, output coupler is the laser. And here's a picture of the first laser, the ruby laser. Notice that curly spiral thing. That's, that's blown glass, and it's just a, a, like an arc lamp. So they just have a gas in there, and they run electricity through it, and it produces a lot of visible light. You could use a mercury lamp. You could have uh, like these tube lights, but just curve it around the gain medium. So that red thing is a ruby crystal inside. Uh, uh, I think it's a sapphire crystal structure with chromium doped into it. That's what ruby is. And again, these are not mined. These are produced. Uh, they're, they're molten, and then you grow it out. You crystallize it very slowly and make a pure crystal structure of, of ruby. And you're constantly supplying this visible light, but, but you have the, um, the resonant cavity there, and the laser medium comes out. So, uh, the thing about these initial uh, laser cavities were these arc lamps required an enormous high voltage to get them started and then a uh, controlled current to, to keep them lit. And so kind of like these fluorescent lights, they have a ballast. So you have to have a high voltage spike at the beginning to get it started, but then the resistance drops dramatically. So you have to have that high voltage shut off and then you run a certain controlled current through there to adjust the brightness. Um, all those electronics were pretty bulky and it generated a lot of heat. So the original lasers, uh, had these huge power supplies that were, you know, the size of a washing machine full of, you know, high power electronics and they had to be water cooled. So then you had water hoses running over to the sink and you constantly, if you're going to have a water cooled system, you're going to have leaks and you're going to have water leaking everywhere and it's a big pain. I hated working with these bulky lasers, mainly because of the water system. Uh, the water evaporates over time in the reservoirs, you got to refill it. And, if you're constantly refilling water and evaporating, then the calcium uh, gets too high and it starts to corrode things and it starts to um, build up scale and then sometimes the cooling blocks get clogged. It's just a nightmare. I absolutely hated water-cooled lasers. And so now we have diode lasers. Oh man, they're great. In fact, I've got one in my hand right here. <laughs> okay. So the original lasers were a real pain. Diode lasers are great. Oh, we also have pulsed lasing, where you want to preserve that population inversion for as long as possible, and then you let it out in just a short blast. And so you can pump this resonant cavity up, um, but you have it be non-resonant for a while. So if any photons come out, they don't come back through the lasing medium. They get ejected. And then you can turn uh, electronically, like either flip a mirror or they use these polarizers that you can flip electronically and then all of the cavity drains very quickly. If we had a pulse laser in our lab that would, that would dump out all of its light in 10 nanoseconds. So we had a 10 nanosecond pulse. We only had maybe 100 millijoules, but if you take 100 millijoules and put it in 10 nanoseconds, it's 10 megawatts of power. So that's an enormous amount of power that the molecules that we're doing spectroscopy on feel. So the electric field that we put on that molecule is 10 megawatts. So 10 joules, 10 uh, million joules delivered in a second if you were to time, time average it. We were delivering 100 millijoules in 10 nanoseconds. But that's a long time for a molecule, 10 nanoseconds. And so we were able to do spectroscopy on, on molecules with those pulsed lasers. Now we have these diode lasers, and this is sort of the cross-section of a diode laser. They, they deal with uh, doped material. So what's a doped material? They have a semiconductor, aluminum, I mean, uh, uh, gallium and arsenic. And then you can take that gallium arsenic semiconductor and you can replace some of the gallium ions with aluminum ions, and you can create positive sort of... Uh, electron holes, and if you dope it with um, um, an element that has a few more electrons, like dope it with germanium or even selenium, then you're putting extra electrons in that 
crystal structure. So you can have a crystal structure that has a few extra electrons, and you can have a crystal structure that has a few less electrons, and you have this hole and electron set, you know, set up, and that's how our light emitting diodes work. So we can tune, basically we're tuning that homo lumo gap by using this doping. Uh, we can even drive protons. See, this is P, uh, P doped gallium arsenic. So we have proton beams, we can make this semiconductor, and we can drive photons or protons in there and create crystal uh, dislocations and again tune that, that homo lumo gap. So we can find the, the wavelength of light that we want. So that's why our diodes, our light emitting diodes, are so diverse. I mean, we can pick an enormous range of, uh, of light to come out of those diodes. This is the size of a diode laser up there on the left. So that's probably the smallest laser, these little diode lasers. And you can see it's compared to a penny. Okay. So it's pretty small. And then this, uh, this building that I'm showing here, that's the largest laser on Earth. Not the most powerful, but it's, it's the largest, okay? And if for scale, you can see these guys right here, <laughs> okay? So there's one of the workers for scale, yeah. Now this is a picture of the National Ignition Facility. And so this room is about the size of a football field, and there's two of them, okay? And it starts with that diode laser. So let's watch, let's ride the beam line. I'm going to stop the video um, because I don't want to get coffee strike.